uh, if you post them in the chat. But ultimately, I will answer questions at the end of the lesson if possible. Okay, so good morning, folks. Welcome to unit two. This is lesson one, metabolism. We're going to start to tie in everything that we learned in unit one to kind of uh, understand how metabolic processes within the cell work and how we utilize everything we learned from unit one to kind of facilitate that metabolic process. Because ultimately, the key thing that we're going to try to connect to unit one from unit two is the idea of how we utilize food and how we break down food as animals. So we are what's called heterotrophs. We need to create our energy from food and we need to break down that food in order to create that energy. So that food is broken down both mechanic mechanically and chemically so that way it can be digested and utilized to create what's called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. I've alluded to ATP throughout last unit a couple of times, specifically with active transport. Now we're going to look at the processes that are responsible for creating that ATP and also for utilizing that ATP. Because ultimately that's what metabolism is. Those metabolic processes are all about creating and utilizing energy. So the key living organisms that use ATP are animals, specifically like ourselves, as well as some single cellular organisms um, but we're going to focus on it in terms of larger uh, plants and animals, just because that is kind of the nature of, of this course. So those living organisms are going to need to continuously capture and use that energy. And they're going to use that ATP molecule to supply that energy for cellular work. That cellular work can be anything from transport to other processes that we will look at. Cellular respiration produces that ATP. It turns glucose into energy via a process that we will look at in a great detail with regards to this unit and pretty much all the units moving forward as we look at the uh, Krebs cycle and we look at mitochondrial processes. So metabolism can kind of be defined uh, as a set of all chemical reactions that kind of keep us alive. When we think of metabolic processes, we're thinking, and when we think of metabolism, we're thinking about the things that keep us alive. And it can be broken down into two separate processes. Uh, the first is uh, catabolic processes or catabolism. These are reactions that break large particles into smaller ones. So digestion is a catabolic process. Uh, so that catabolic uh, reaction or catabolism is breaking large particles into smaller ones. So the, the key distinction is that it breaks large particles into smaller ones. When we look at the anabolic process or anabolism, we're looking at reactions that build larger pro that build larger particles. So where the let me get my highlight already. Where the catabolic processes are looking to break larger particles, the anabolic processes are going to build larger particles, and they're building them from those smaller pieces that were processed in that catabolic pathway above. So it's going to take that resource of food. It's going to take all that energy that it makes as a result of that food and it's going to use it to build proteins and amino acids as it needs to. Or proteins from amino acids as it needs to. So we need to understand how energy is used in living organisms in order to understand the process of those metabolic processes uh, in a bigger picture. So when we talk about energy, we're talking about energy in terms of two potential states that it can exist. Kinetic energy is as a result of motion. Your heart's beating, ions movement, um, ion movement, anything that allows for movement is thinking of in terms, we're thinking of in terms of kinetic energy. That kinetic energy is directly tied into motion. Potential energy is looking at stored energy in chemical processes, gravitational uh, pull or gravitational potential energy. And for the sake of this class, that's kind of what we're going to really be focusing on for this unit and specifically this lesson, we're looking at the energy stored in chemical bonds. So the chemical bonds that store all of that energy, we're looking at breaking them apart and reforming things in using that energy as a means to kind of sustain life. Again, that metabolic process is an attempt to sustain life and all of those things that it does is in an attempt to sustain life. So to further understand our, our energy aspects and our energy needs, we have to understand the first law of thermodynamics, that in a closed system, which cells are, energy remains constant. So energy cannot be created or destroyed. 
but we transfer that energy between forms. So we take that chemical energy from food and we turn it into heat or into ATP and we create those chemical energy bonds for use later. So all organisms obtain energy in two ways. The first is through chemical energy via food and it's stored in those bonds that we talked about in that potential energy. So that potential energy is stored in bonds via food and we utilize that chemically. Sunlight energy, which we will spend a bit of time talking about next week, is how plants basically turn raw energy from the sun via photosynthesis into food energy. And it ultimately is what we get the vast majority, if not all of, our energy from. So we're going to look at energy changes during a chemical reaction. This is where our understanding of, of biochemistry kind of helps out. And during these chemical reactions, these bonds are going to, between atoms are going to be formed and broken. And as a result of that, we're going to look at this rearrangement of atoms as a means to develop energy, uh, specifically when we look at the breakdown of a carbohydrate or a hydrocarbon using oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. In this case of combustion, you'll start to see that some of these metabolic processes all resemble combustion in some way, shape, or form. And that's because they are quite similar. We take a hydrocarbon, we take oxygen, and we, we catabolize or, or metabolize that to create a reaction which produces energy, carbon dioxide, and water. So I have a couple of notes here that we're gonna talk about. Uh, this is just the word equation, that methane and oxygen reacts to form carbon dioxide and water. That energy needs to be utilized, and I'll just erase all that stuff. That energy needs to be put in at the start to rate, uh, at the start of that reaction to break those bonds, and then energy is released as a result of those new bonds forming in that product. So energy in and energy out is gonna be a mantra that I consistently uh, harken back towards every single time I talk about metabolic processes because it's quite consistent in terms of you need to spend energy to make money. Or sorry, you need to spend energy to make energy. You need to spend money to make money. The same adage is true for many things in metabolic processes. So when we look at where energy is required and when we look at how it is used, energy is, is absorbed in order to break those bonds in the reactants and then energy is released when those products form. The energy release can be converted into different forms. And that's kind of the main thing here that we need to focus on with metabolic processes is that it becomes that free energy or useful energy. So even though the cell needs to spend energy in order to break those bonds, that energy before was stored in those chemical bonds and it was useless essentially to the cell. In order for it to become useful, it needs to break those bonds down. Oh, sorry, those are some sirens that are, as I live in the downtown court, can quite get a little bit loud wait till they pass all right that chemical energy that's stored in those bonds is quite useless to the cell and so in order for the cell to make use of it it has to convert it into different forms thermal mechanical what have you and this free energy is that useful energy that the cell needs to utilize and capture so this energy needs to be absorbed and it needs to be uh be absorbed to break a specific covalent bond that's called bond energy so that bond energy is always going to be found in any type of covalent bond, specifically in those hydrocarbon chains that we've talked about. And when you look at this chart and you look at how much energy is stored between some of these, um, these types of bonds, that's the amount of energy that we're looking at trying to utilize and harness specifically. So when we look at what patterns that exist in this chart, we have to really take a, into consideration that double bonds have way higher energy bond energy, have higher bond energies than single bonds. So that means that they're going to require way more energy to break. And that different bonding atoms contain different energy amounts. So when you think about it in terms of what holds the most energy on average, you're looking at that C double bond O, which has that the maximal amount of energy. And when you think to the chemical composition of sugar and fats that we learned about in unit one, you can start to see how those things start to intertwine. Those carboxyl groups, uh, some of those hydroxyl groups also involved. It really starts to lend to the idea that, okay, carbohydrates, sugars, what have you, specifically have the most amount of energy to utilize for cells. So when we talk about that chemical reaction that's required uh, to, to kind of take place, 
You got to spend that money to get that energy, so to speak. So we've talked a bit about activation energy uh, with regards to enzymatic reactions. And it's important to recognize that this is the energy needed to start that reaction. So the energy needed to break the reactant bonds. Now, if the cell had to spend 800 kilojoules per mole of energy to break that C double bond O, and it was only getting 800 kilojoules per mole to get that, and like to utilize that energy, it's a net zero. The cell would not be efficient if it had to spend the exact same amount of energy to get the same amount of energy. And that's where enzymes really start to shine and come into play. And that's why we focus so much on it in unit one, because when we think about what enzymes do, they lower that activation energy. But uh, I'll get to that when we move into specific processes. It's just something for you to start to connect the dots. Uh, transition state is the uh, brief stage where bonds in the reactants are breaking and reforming in those products. So that transition state is the process of breaking a bond and then reforming it into another process or through another process into another product. And we'll talk more about that transition state as it relates to activation energy. The last thing I want to talk about with regards to uh, the intro to metabolic processes is the types of reaction. These types of reaction can be classified as two types. They can either be exothermic or endothermic. With regards to exothermic, we're looking at a chemical reaction in which more energy is released than it is absorbed. So it leaves products with less chemical potential energy than their reactants. And this is something I'm going to highlight because it's quite important in the context of what we are studying. It's leaving the products with less chemical potential energy than their reactants. This means that the energy input is going to be less than the energy of the products produced. This is a very important statement. I'll let that sink in for five seconds. Energy input is less than the energy of the products. With regards to endothermic, we're looking at chemical reactions in which more energy is absorbed than is released, giving the products more chemical energy than their reactants. So again, this means that the energy input will be greater than the energy of the product. So what does this all mean in the context of what we are learning? Well, Chemical potential energy is that energy stored in our bonds, and it's energy in the form of heat. And so when we look at that example where energy is in the form of heat with regards to reaction progress in an endothermic and an exothermic reaction, it's important that we recognize that the breaking reactant bonds and that forming of those product bonds is going to have different energy levels. Okay, And in that chart that you have with your notes in front of you, we're looking at that exothermic and endothermic reaction and energy charts. And ultimately, what we're, what we're looking at this and, and taking away from is that not um, all energy absorbed in a reaction is taking place, right? That net energy absorbed is going to be that energy that can be utilized for any type of reaction. So lastly, when determining energy change during a reaction, we're going to compare energy that it takes to break the bonds between the atoms of the reactants, that activation energy, with the energy released as its products form, because ultimately that difference is going to be where we harness that energy to go through cellular processes, metabolic processes, what have you. So we will not use the average bond energy values to predict this, or sorry, we will use the average energy bonds uh, values to predict this. This helps us to determine every single aspect that we need in terms of how much energy will be utilized to break those bonds and how much energy we can harness in order to do work within the cell. <laughs> so I have a sample problem here that will uh, be a little bit difficult for some, but I want to give you all some time to really truly understand this concept uh, because ultimately when we're looking at this amount of energy that is used and the amount of energy that is harnessed, we need to really understand how these processes uh, work in order to answer questions just like this. So I'm going to say determine whether combustion of methane is an exothermic or endothermic reaction. We need to calculate the energy absorbed or released by the reaction of one mole of methane. And this is where our, if we do have a background in grade 11 chemistry, it, it will really help us. If not, I'm going to break down how we would do that now. So. The, the first thing we need to understand here is the 
chemical equation of combustion of methane, which is CH4 plus 2O2, which then is going to form the products of two hot, uh, water molecules and one carbon dioxide molecule. When we think about the amount of energy, right, we really have to look back at that chart. We really have to look back at that table all the way back up here that tells us how much energy is stored within that bond type. Okay, that average bond energy between a carbon and a hydrogen, between, between hydrogen and hydrogen, etc. Because that's the key thing that's going to help us to determine how much energy we have to, uh, or how much energy is, is absorbed and released. So with our models that we've created, we see that methane has four carbon-hydrogen bonds, and we're going to add it to two oxygen molecules, which have two O double bonds, and it's going to create two H2O molecules, which have two OH bonds each. And then we're going to have a CO2 molecule, which has two C double bound to O. So the energy that is produced versus the activation energy, or the energy of those products in terms of the activation energy, we can calculate the activation energy by calculating it separately. So we have four OH bonds, two C double O bonds, which gives us a total activation or product energy of 3,434 kilojoules. Whereas when we look at that activation energy, where we just look at that C to H bond, which there are four of, and those two double bond O's, we have 2,632 kilojoules, which as a result, when we calculate the difference between the product, or the product energy and the activation energy, we find that there is a net gain of 802, the reactants minus from the products, which will give us an exothermic reaction. Because when we think about an exothermic reaction, we're looking at the energy of input being less than the energy of the products. So there are a couple of questions for you to try on your own. Uh, they will be a little bit tricky at first, but this chart will be your absolute best friend in terms of determining what the energy is of those products versus what the energy is of those uh, initial chemicals. So I'm going to stop the recording here to answer some questions if you might have them. Uh, and then in, I'll give you about 10, 15 minutes maybe, and then we'll start up with the lesson two.